our exhibits at the Writers Collection help provide insight into how artists based in Texas and the Southwest interpret their home region. The writers here tonight have done a masterful job documenting their personal reactions to what was the signature event of their generation. Their first-hand accounts not only aid the work of future <coughs> historians, they also captivate us as readers. Their works not only help us understand the war, they help us understand themselves. And through that shared transaction, we begin to understand ourselves. Literature is not a magic solution to the world's problems, but it sure can do a lot of good. And that's why we're here today, tomorrow, and beyond. And that's why we work so hard to preserve our literary heritage. Our moderator, Mark Busby, will introduce the panelists, but before he does, I want to take just a moment to introduce Mark for you guys. Mark Busby, or as he's sometimes known, Dr. Busy. <laughs> this is how he was referred to in a recent typo that was widely distributed around the campus. He's a man of many hats. He's a professor of English at Texas State. He's also director of the Southwest Regional Humanities Center here on campus. He co-edits two scholarly journals, and he's a scholar of some renown himself, having written and edited several books on the literature of the American Southwest. Mark is the immediate past president of the Texas Institute of Letters, and I'm pleased to report that he served out his term without being impeached. <laughs> Congratulations, Mark. Mark works very closely with the Southwestern Writers Collection in a number of significant ways. He serves on our advisory board, he's helped facilitate major acquisitions, and he's a major donor to the collection himself. Mark has moderated panel discussions for us in the past, including a symposium on the writer John Graves and a panel held in conjunction with our exhibit, Paths to Justice, African American Culture in Texas. So you can see why it's easy to slip up and refer to you as Dr. Busy from time to time. <laughs> Mark is also a novelist. His book, Fort Benning Blues, explores Vietnam from the perspective of a draftee who never fought in Southeast Asia. Mark attended officer candidate school in 1970, at the very same time that resistance to the war was peaking here in the US. And the ambivalence of Mark's position during that time is expertly detailed in his novel. Publishers Weekly praised Fort Benning Blues for being a memorable account, and it heralded Mark's strengths as a novelist, referring to his crystal clear voice and his skills as an open-minded reporter. And I think that tonight we'll see those same attributes of Dr. Busby's on display as he moderates this discussion. So ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you for coming, and I'll give you Mark Busby and our panel. I think I'd be, rather be referred to as Mark Busy than uh, the way I sometimes get junk mail to Mark Busty. <laughs> I'm pleased to see as many of you out tonight. And I want to begin by acknowledging that this is Veterans Day. And Veterans Day, of course, is a time to honor veterans and also to reflect upon the past, the present, and the future of wars. And that's one of the things that we'll be doing here tonight. Um, the Bible, as the Reverend Flynn uh, would remind us, uh, says that there will always be wars and rumors of wars, and perhaps we would like to one day uh, prove that that may not be true. I'd like to recognize briefly that it's also the 82nd birthday of Kurt Vonnegut, Jr. I'll ask uh, some of these panelists if they might reflect on some of the writers who uh, influenced their work. and. Uh, and I'll acknowledge up front that Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five was a major influence on my own my own writing. I'd also like to take a moment to wish for peace for the world, for our troops, and to hope that our troops in Iraq are home safely and soon, especially those in house-to-house -house combat tonight, uh, or I suppose it's in the morning in Fallujah. I'd like to acknowledge the importance of Steve Davis who just uh, gave me that nice introduction. Uh, Steve is the assistant curator of the Southwestern Writers Collection, and it was pretty much his idea. He conceived and organized this session and the exhibit that uh, I hope all of you had a chance to, to look at. Um, although he and I worked on the bibliography together, by far most of it is his work. And if you're interested in knowing more about Texas literature in the 60s, then I'd refer you to Steve's book, Texas Literary Outlaws, which uh, explores uh, Texas literature in the 60s uh, in, in great and uh, exciting detail. 
We have four writers here tonight who represent four distinct aspects of the Vietnam experience. Uh, one who wrote about what it meant to be a young Marine, Michael Rodriguez. One who wrote as a former Marine, then a journalist uh, who went to Vietnam to cover the war, Robert Flynn. Um, one who wrote about what it was like to be inside the military family and protest against the war, Sarah Bird, and one who uh, has examined the way uh, young officers were trained to lead troops, and that's my experience. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, each of the, the panelists and ask them to talk first about what they were doing during Vietnam, just to give us some background about, about what uh, happened to them personally during the Vietnam era, and then to talk about their work as it relates to Vietnam. And those two things, of course, intersect. But as writers, we always have to say, yes, we wrote something about Vietnam, but that may not have been true about us. We may not have done what that character who seems to have been based upon us was like. That there is, a, there is fiction, and then there is memoir, and most of us have written fiction, although uh, Bob Flynn has written uh, a nonfiction book about Vietnam as well. So uh, he's lied in all kinds of different forms. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, here's, the, here's the order uh, that we'll go through after I introduce them, uh, Mike, Bob, Sarah, and then I'll, I'll uh, follow up the rear, the drag. Let me begin by talking about Michael Rodriguez. You have, I think, some information about everybody, and I'll repeat a little bit of it. Uh, Michael enlisted in the Marine Corps four days after he graduated from high school in 1965. Uh, and uh, he reported for duty as a rifleman with the 1st Marine Division in Vietnam in late 1966 and returned to the United States in, uh, in 1967. He stayed in the Marine Corps for five years and got out in 1970, lived in California for a while, and then returned to Texas. Uh, uh, he has been an advocate of uh, and for Vietnam veterans since 1984 when he attended his first veterans reunion. He co-founded the Alamo Area Veter Vietnam Veterans. He was a co-founder of Vietnam Veterans Chapter 366, a former board, board member of the Vietnam Veterans Foundation of Texas, past president of the Vietnam Veterans of the 2nd Battalion and 1st Marines Association, and he's the former editor of the Texas BVA News, the state newspaper for Vietnam veterans in Texas. He's a 1995 graduate of Incarnate Word College, where he majored in communication arts, and he's currently in the Master of Fine Arts program here at uh, Texas State, and uh, he tells me that he's going to finish this spring and be out there in the world. Um, another, another way of thinking about the another world. world. Another. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, uh, if, you, if you need a good writer, uh, somebody will be available this, this spring. His first book, Humidity Moon, which is available out here for purchase, I saw only a few co copies left, uh, it was published in 1998. He also has a number of works available on his website, which uh, I'll, I'll ask him to give you uh, in a minute. If not, you can just Google up Humidity Moon Rodriguez and you'll find his, uh, his website. Uh, so next we'll... Uh, will be Robert Flynn. Robert Flynn uh, was president of the Texas Institute of Letters a couple of presidents before me. I don't think he was impeached either, um, but uh, that, that was just sheer luck, I expect. Uh, he's from Chillicothe, Texas. He received a Bachelor of Arts from Baylor in 1958, a Master's from Baylor in 56. He attended the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He was in the Marines in 1950. 1952 during Korea, but as he'll probably tell you, he didn't go to uh, to the war in Korea. Uh, he married uh, Jean Sorrells in 1953, and Jean uh, is here tonight. Jean is also a writer. Jean Flynn uh, writes a, a good deal for young young adults and, and children, especially about Texas history. He was instructor at Gardner Webb College in uh, in Boiling Springs, North Carolina, at the end of the 50s and an assistant professor of Baylor from 1953 uh, until 63. And now, are you distinguished professor emeritus? Is that your official title? I think just, just professor. Just professor emeritus. No, I'm not even emeritus. Well, <laughs> he should be. He should be. <laughs> 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 
He has retired from Trinity University <laughs> and uh, now is an ex extinguished professor uh, from Trinity <laughs> University. <laughs> um, he is the author of a number of books, a number of important books. Uh, North to Yesterday in 1967 is one of my favorite of his. I like to call it the Catch-22 of Trail Drive novels, a kind of black humor, very funny book uh, about uh, people wanting to go up the trail long after the trail had closed. Uh, North to Yesterday and the House of the Lord in 69, The Sounds of Rescue, The Signs of Hope, 1970. <coughs> Uh, Seasonal Rain and Other Stories in 1986, which uh, is a collection of stories. Some of those stories are about Vietnam. Uh, Wanderer Springs, 1988. The Last Click in 1994, and that is K-L-I-C-K. And those of you who have military uh, connections will recognize that that's the, the term for kilometer, the last click, but it has a double meaning in this novel, and that a click is the last thing you hear before the booby trap explodes. Uh, Living with the Hyenas, another collection of stories in 95. The Devil's Tiger came shortly after that, co-authored with the late Dan Klepper. Uh, and then after that, and he's been really busy in the last uh, few years, uh, a novel, Type Ass Country, a collection of essays. When, when he, put, he put on his other hat, a collection of essays called Growing Up a Sullen Baptist. Not a Southern Baptist, but a Sullen Baptist. Uh, and then he's the co-editor of a book uh, about Paul Baker, Paul Baker and the Integration of Abilities, and his most recent publication, I think, Busy Man, I can't quite keep up with him, yes. Slouching Towards Zion and More Lies. This is a, sort of a follow-up to growing up a, a sullen Baptist, a collection of essays. Where I think many of them were published in The Door, which is described as the world's pretty much only magazine of religious satire. <laughs> now, a book of religious satire, uh, slouching, slouching toward Zion. Um, at one time he wrote, I am in the broadest sense of the word a religious writer. I want to record, clarify, and celebrate man's efforts to understand, endure, and ultimately survive his world. Because my formative years were spent on a farm, I have always felt close to nature Perhaps that is more readily apparent than literary influences in my work. And I read that and I thought, that's very serious coming from Bob Flynn. And then I realized that what that meant was that growing up on a farm, it meant he had a great vision of cattle, which means that he, he has known and seen more bullshit than almost anybody uh, imaginable, and it prepared him to be a, to be a writer. Our, uh, our next panelist is Sarah Bird. Sarah was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but is pretty much a peripatetic uh, child of the military, an Air Force family. She's, uh, and she'll talk, uh, uh, that's, a, that's central to her work. She received a BA in anthropology at the University of New Mexico in 1973 and an MA in journalism at the University of Texas in Austin in 76. She was an editor and a contributor for the, the now defunct Austin magazine called Third Coast. She's authored five romance novels under the name oh, Tori Cates. Uh, <laughs> and in fact, she has a great essay about how to write a romance novel. Uh, like exactly which paragraph and on which page the next kiss or the next grope has to come. So, uh, if you want to know anything about how to write a romance novel, then uh, Tori Cates uh, Tori knows Cates everything. To to Tori that. Cates is now <laughs> out there in the farm, uh, out there in the field. <laughs> Uh, under her own name, <laughs> she has published Alamo House in 1986, The Boyfriend School in 89, it, and the subtitle, is it, uh, no, it's Alamo House, the, the subtitle is uh, Men with, men, uh, Women Without Men, Men Without Brains, is that right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's, uh, I, I actually intended that to be the title, but the, the, uh, the poet just said, oh, we might offend someone. I said, oh. You know, we should be so nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, let's not ever offend anybody. Uh, the Mommy Club, 99, Virgin of the Rodeo, 93, and her most recent novel, The Yakota Officers Club. The Yakota Officers Club won the Jesse Jones Award, Award for the Best Book of Fiction in 2001 from the Texas Institute of Letters. She has also written screenplays and published uh, a, a number of articles in Cosmopolitan, Mademoiselle, Ms. Um, her resume is interesting to see the many things that Sarah has done besides write romance novels and 
other things. She sold Western wear at Penny's, worked on archaeological digs at Taos Puebla, was a go-go dancer in Tokyo, was a psychiatric aide at Mercy Hospital in San Diego, a receptionist at Albuquerque Paint and Body Shop. Uh, she was the clerk at the lighting fixture store, a scuba diving instructor, Costa Brava, Spain, an au pair for a family in Tignes, France, a botanical garden guide in Palafrugel, Spain. Let's, let's cut to the chase. I was working for the CIA. A life for this. That's the only way to explain this, isn't it? Uh, either that or she could never hold a job. Uh, she produced the Texas Mental Health Mental Retardation Agency publication, a, a publication for them, traveled throughout Texas to interview and photograph schizophrenics, like, uh, psychiatrists, Down syndrome residents, AIDS researchers, autistics, and all the people who live and work at the state's institutions. And I can't think of a better preparation for writing than uh, some of that. Uh, she writes, I wrote on such subjects as the forbidden world of Mormon gays at Brigham Young, an Apache coming of age ceremony in White Mountain, Arizona, the Gallup, New Mexico intertribal ceremonial rodeo, uh, her surprise wedding, uh, her parents kidnap or of parents kidnapping their own children, women on offshore oil rigs, and many other interesting topics. She happens to be working on a novel for Knopf, which she tells me was supposed to be there last May, but we're sure it'll be there before this next one, and it is entitled The Flamenco Academy, which she describes as an intense, that means not funny, novel about obsessive love set in the New, New Mexico flamenco dance community. So. Those are our panelists, and as I said, I've asked each one of them to take a few minutes to talk first about what they were doing in Vietnam, and then about how Vietnam affects their work. And they'll take about 10 or 15 minutes each, then there'll be time, for, uh, I hope, for questions from you. If not, I have a number of questions for, for each of them. So we'll start with Michael Rodriguez. Thank you. What was I doing in uh, Let me ask first, who's here tonight for grade? Come on, you can put your hands up. Who's here for grade? Uh, okay, thank you. My thank you for coming in. My students. <laughs> what was I doing in Vietnam? I was getting shot at. Um, I landed in Vietnam in September 1966, left in December uh, following year. I was a rifleman, your basic grunt with hotel company of the 2nd Battalion, 1st Marine Regiment, 1st Marine Division. And I came late to this writing gig. I didn't write my first short story until 1995, based on, uh, I was telling Steve earlier, whenever I thought about it, whenever I reflected back on Vietnam, it seems like the whole time I was there was compressed into the summer of 1967. I had no memory of anything before May. I had no memory of anything after the middle of September. And I knew I'd been there longer, but I couldn't, for whatever reason, stretch that time out. So I decided the best way to try to make sense of whatever it was that I'd done and said and felt and been was to write the story of whatever came into my head. And the first thing that came into my head late one night was an incident in where my rifle squad had gone out on an ambush one night, and when we broke it just before uh, dawn, we left a guy behind who was sound asleep. And we had a fire team now to go back and look for him. That's all the story is about. That's all that happened in the incident. There was no ambush. There was a possibility of it, but, but nothing happened. And so I wrote the story. Uh, I sent out, and that really sounds easier than it was, I wrote an installment, a part of the story, and I was on a Vietnam mailing list, internet mailing list, and I sent out this little short installment at 3.30 on a Sunday morning to 250 people, and then promptly forgot about it the next morning, or the next, I guess, afternoon when I woke up. It wasn't until later that day that I checked in. I checked my email and found that there was all these responses and all this outrage, the fact that I'd sent up a piece of a story and where was the rest. Of course, they weren't referring to me by name, and I kept thinking, who was that son of a bitch that did that? <laughs> <laughs> and so fortunately, somebody had, had included the, my little title in my name. And 
the initial pan cast quickly. I brought, the, I brought this thing back up and looked at it. Decided it was pretty good. So I wrote a second installment. Couldn't figure out what else to say. And I, I set up the first one and said, to be continued at 3.30 in the morning Sunday. Second one, I got as far as I could go uh, and said to be continued and sent it out. And I did that, I guess, for five installments until the thing just kind of, you know, you go looking for a guy at night and you bring him back, that's pretty much, you know, what happens. And you can't go more than five installments anyway. But if one person of those 200, I think it was 251 people on that, on that mailing list, if one person had said that that story sucked, I don't think I would have written anything ever again. All of the feedback was positive, however. Uh, and I thought, well, this is cool. And I went off and did whatever it was I was doing. And then somebody, two or three weeks later, asked on the, on the list if I was going to write anything else. So I thought about it. And I wrote one called Parachute Flare. And that's Bob Flynn bought my book early on, just after it had been published. And the next time I saw him, he said, I, you know, I read Parachute Flare and nothing happened. Nothing happened. He says, and then I realized that that's the point. Not all Vietnam was gunfire. You know, not all Vietnam was moving from one place to another. There was a lot of downtime. Uh, there were things that happened that did not require getting shot at. But whatever it was we did had the possibility that we'd be shot at. And the tension in those moments was probably even more intense than being shot at. Because now there's almost a sense of relief of, thank Christ, you know, the monotony is broken or we don't have to walk anymore. We can lay here a little while, you know, bang away at the little people. And then I did write a couple of, you know, I wrote them to make sense of what it was that I had done and said and felt and tasted and breathed and inhaled my time in Vietnam. It was the most exciting time in my life. It had its moments where it was downright scary and frantic. But I'm not sorry I did it. Uh, and I did not go out of a sense of patriotism. You know, in those days we had the draft, which is probably foreign to almost everybody in here. You would go into the military. Um, if you weren't going to college, and you know, Southside Chicano was out of San Antonio, Westside Chicano was out of San Antonio, didn't go to college. So we could either enlist in, in the service of our choice, or we could wait to be drafted, in which case everybody went into the Army. I was not going to go in the Army. So four days out of, out of high school, I enlisted in the Marine Corps. I thought I was a tough guy. I wanted to join a tough outfit, and then I discovered that I wasn't tough at all. Marine Corps was. The Marine Corps owned me for five years, and it was always yes sir and no sir. And I don't, I don't regret those five years in either, and it, and it's reflected today in, in some of the language that I use. Um, I like to say that I left the Marine Corps in 1970, but the Marine Corps never left me. I wrote the stories. I published the book. I've had uh, essays published in. in Anthologies by University of California, Oxford University, Press is publishing an anthology next year in which one of mine is included. Um, a book by Jonathan Shea, Dr. Jonathan Shea, on combat trauma is already out in which he references one of my smaller essays. And those are all well and good. The problem with writing the way I started writing is that I had no feedback. I mean, my wife read them, she thought they were great. She's like, why? You know, of course they're great. But I didn't know. I mean, when the book came out, the book sold well, but it was a small publishing company, uh, University Press, actually. And so it was a small run. And the first few hundred copies of the book that sold, we were able to track pretty much who was buying it. And we discovered that about 65% of the buyers were women, which was really curious, and I thought we just lost control of the demographics. But I still did, I didn't know what I was doing. I was writing these stories, I was writing them as I remembered them. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing. And so I decided 
to check out the MFA programs in creative writing. And was accepted. And it all goes well. I become an unemployed writer in May of next year. Instead of just a low rent student. <laughs> You want to you want to read a, a, a page or two of one of your stories to give them a flavor of your sure. work. Yeah. This is from uh, the parachute flare. I shake I shake my eyes in time to see the flare pop free from its small aluminum tube. Bright white light bathes the west end of the perimeter and we hunker down deeper into the bush and fighting holes that, that provide our cover. My eyes and the top of my head are the only exposed parts of my body. I use a flare's light to quickly scan the bush and rise paddy to my front for gooks. I see nothing but shadows, nothing moves, nothing moves. Good, I say to myself. I adjust my position trying to make myself com comfortable. Chinga madre, I think. What I would give for a smoke, a beer, a tamale, and a chicanita right here and right now. <laughs> well, why not wish we were back in East LA on board while you're at it? No shit, don't I wish. I hear a soft movement behind me, the whisper of cloth on leaves. I turn quickly and easily, shotgun out in front of my body. I see his eyes and face long before he sees me, my friend Carter. He's looking for me, sees me, and heads in my direction. He crawls into my, into my hole panting softly with the effort he's made to get there. Hey, homeboy, I whisper to him, what's up? He's panting slow as his eyes never leaving the front of my tiny piece of perimeter. Hey, he says. All right, stay out front. I don't rush him. Carter will tell me what's happening when he's ready. I want to go get it, he says. Get what, I ask. The parachute. I want to go get the parachute from that flare. I turn to stare at him. Are you shitting me? I crap you zero ounces, man. I want to go get that parachute. I look at his face. Carter's a corporal, a team leader of Marines. He's got nine, maybe ten months in the bushes of grunt. He knows better. We do not leave the fucking perimeter unless we are told to leave the perimeter. And no one has told us to leave the perimeter. Ain't nobody told us to leave the fucking perimeter, I says, Joey, you nuts. The light, the flare's light has all but disappeared, gently returning the Vietnam night to its former inky black. Our perimeter is platoon size. Third platoon is over there, second platoon is over there, and we're over here. We are as deep in the Badlands. I do not want to be here, and I know Carter does not want to be here, so what is all this bullshit? Fine, I said, whatever. If you want the parachute, go get the damn thing. Um, yeah, well, and I turned to him immediately suspicious. Yeah, well, what? Uh, well, you know, i got to have some backup. Are you nuts? Are you fucking nuts? Come on, man. What's the problem? We slide out, we get we get the shoot, we get back a piece of cake. Fuck you. He leans back in my fighting hole. I know his eyes are, have marked the parachute's fault. He knows where it is. I'm going to go get it, he says. You want to come with me? I'm exasperated beyond belief. Wait till morning. We'll go get it then. No, he says. No, I want to go get it now. Ah, God damn it. Carter lets a smirk start across start its way across his face. I remember, you know, this past summer, yeah, yeah, I say. Wasn't for me, yeah, yeah, I say, yeah. We pause and listen to the night. Our eyes are almost useless in the dark, so we trust to other senses, the smell and hearing. We hear nothing. We hear exactly what we want to hear, nothing. I don't want to call in old debts, he says, or anything. Hell, you don't. You coming out there with me? If not, I'll go alone. And I went with him. And if you visit his website, you'll see a, a, a picture of that uh, of that parachute uh, signed by at least a few of the yeah the guys in the, the remaining guys in, in uh, third platoon. All right, now we're going to go to uh, to uh, Bob Flint. Yesterday was the Marine Corps birthday, so Hooray! happy birthday, fellow Marine! <laughs> In the humidity of the moon, I rank as one of the top, within the top three or four books about novels about Vietnam. It's great, and you should buy it. During the Vietnam War, I was a drama professor at Trinity, and my country was at war. I thought everyone knew while we were in Vietnam. The Yalta Agreement signed by Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin guaranteed self-determination by the countries liberated from Nazi occupation. 
The Cold War began when Stalin failed to keep that agreement. In 1947, Truman proclaimed the Truman Doctrine, a policy of containment, and supported Turkey, Greece, and Iran against communist insurgents. In 1948, Truman authorized the Berlin airlift when the Soviets cut off access to the city. In 1950, Truman ordered U.S. troops to fight under the flag of the United Nations in Korea and sent military advisors to Vietnam. 1950. Congress approved the NATO agreement to contain the spread of communism in Europe. In 1952, Eisenhower paid three-fourths of the cost of France's war in Indochina. Actually, he paid it. We paid it. In 1954, Eisenhower refused to sign the peace accords between Vietnam and France and created the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization committing the U.S. to defend South Vietnam. In 1955, Eisenhower agreed that the U.S. would train the military of South Vietnam. In 1956, Eisenhower failed, some say refused, to guarantee elections in South Vietnam. In 1962, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis brought the world to the brink of nuclear war. With the nuclear standoff in the West, Khrushchev turned to wars of national liberation in the East. In 1963, Kennedy was assassinated a month after the assassination of President Diem of South Vietnam. In 1964, China threatened to attack Taiwan. In 1965, Sukarno led Indochina, Indonesia, the world's fourth most populous nation, out of the UN and allied himself to North Vietnam and China. Some 80 British ships and Australian ship troops were sent to defend Malaysia from Indonesia. India was already in the Soviet orbit, and it was feared if they fell behind the Iron Curtain, Pakistan would follow. Half of Laos was occupied by the communists. Cambodia, Burma, and Thailand could not defend themselves from North Vietnam. That was Eisenhower's domino theory. It really wasn't about San Francisco. Kennedy knew the Vietnam War was not winnable, but he kept, well, wait a minute, I'm skipping here something. Okay. Excuse me just a minute. Eisenhower, who signed the peace, the ceasefire with uh, North Korea, knew that the Vietnam War could not be won. At best, there could be a stalemate like that in Korea and that would require a stable government in Saigon and control of South Vietnam's lengthy border with North Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. If you remember the Korean War, the North Korean army was defeated, but and Truman wanted them to stop short of the Yalu River. General Eisenhower announced that he was going to cross the Yalu, that the MacArthur. General MacArthur, sorry, General MacArthur said he was going to cross the Yalu and the uh, army of China would uh, collapse in 24 hours. It did not, it not, did not happen. They had already crossed the border. And we avoided, and the UN avoided defeat in Korea only because we controlled the air and the sea and because Korea was a peninsula. And behind tr tr uh, trenches and bunkers, a massive Chinese army could be contained because we control the air and the sea. So Eisenhower, who signed the ceasefire with North Korea, knew that the Vietnam War could not be won. At best, it would be there could be a stalemate like that in Korea, and that would require a stable government in Saigon and control of South Vietnam's lengthy border with North Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. In 1960, on the eve of the inauguration, Eisenhower told Kennedy that to save South Vietnam, the U.S. would have to put troops in Laos. Eisenhower committed the U.S. to defend South Vietnam in a war he knew could not be won because he did not occupy Laos. Kennedy knew the Vietnam War was not winnable, but he kept Eisenhower's commitment to defend South Vietnam. He didn't send troops to Laos. 
he did negotiate the Laos Accords with the Soviets in 1962, in which the Soviets guaranteed that North Vietnam could not use Laos and Cambodia to infiltrate or attack South Vietnam. The Soviets did not enforce the treaty when it went into effect in October 1962. <coughs> Kennedy met with Soviet Ambassador McCoyan that month, and he was encouraged to confront McCoyan over the Soviets' failure to act on the Laos Accord. Kennedy had just faced down the Soviets over the, the Cuban Missile Crisis and wasn't ready for another confrontation. When you shoot a bear, you have to decide whether it's better to go over and kick it or walk away and hope you don't see it again. That bear was not dead. Lyndon Johnson was the third president who knew the Vietnam War could not be won at an acceptable cost but did not occupy Laos. In 1964, the Joint Chiefs urged Johnson to use all necessary military means, including the use of nuclear weapons to defeat North Vietnam and probably China after China joined the war. Johnson refused. Chinese troops could not be contained in Southeast Asia with conventional weapons, and in 1964, China had a nuclear bomb would the Soviet Union stay out of such a war. The major effect on me was to create an interest in how we form, form reality. There was a time when reality was based on the five senses. It was real because you saw it or heard it. Now our reality is based on sensation created and shaped by others. We saw Lee Harvey Oswald shot on television. Actually, most of us saw a rerun of Lee Harvey Oswald being shot after being told that's what we were going to see. We saw a man walk on the moon. I stayed up late that night to see a man walk on the moon or the moon landing. Maybe you did too. Wouldn't a rerun have been the same thing? I don't think so. Some people saw the face of, Star of Satan in the collapse of the World Trade Center although Satan's image has been created by artists. Some see the face of Jesus in a tortilla, but no one knows what the face of Jesus looked like. I once knew a young man who could not discriminate between television dramas and television news. Now I can't either. <laughs> Thank you. Now um, we'll hear from Sarah Bird. That was an amazing perspective. Thank you, Bob. Um, I suspected that I would feel like a fraud sitting on this panel, and I, I certainly do more so than I than I feared I would. I would uh, like to start off by acknowledging, first of all, the bravery of the men on this panel with me, and uh, that of everyone in the audience, who the veterans who are here with us tonight. And uh, my father was in the military, and I honor. I honor that career and I honor that service to our country. I'm gonna answer Mark's question by reading from my last novel, The Yakota Officers Club, because it it's probably a lot closer to a memoir than, than a novel. It's very, very autobiographical and uh, much, much of uh, what I wrote about uh, my character Bernie applied to me and my situation at uh, the time of the Vietnam War. As this uh, short section I'm going to read opens, uh, my, my character, Bernie, is on, as I did, is on her way from, uh, from America to Okinawa, where her military family was stationed. And she had been left behind to spend her first year, as I was left behind to spend my first year at the University of New Mexico. So she's been apart from her family for a year. She's made this 17-hour flight across the Pacific to rejoin her family in Okinawa, and she's sitting next to uh, a young wife on her way to join her husband in Okinawa. The plane hits an air pocket, belly flops a few hundred feet, and my seatmate, Tammy, grips my arm, digging her pearlized pink nails into my flesh. Tammy looks only slightly older than my sister, Kit, who is 17. 
but Tammy is on her way to Okinawa so that her baby daughter Brandy, asleep on her lap, can meet her father, Tech Sergeant Roy Eberhardt, for the first time. The cabin lights flicker, and Tammy and I look to the front of the plane to see if the steward eye are freaking in any manifest way. The pilot just rotated out of NAM. Tammy has made this observation every time the plane wobbled for the past 17 hours since we left Travis Air Force Base. The implication is that if a pilot is good enough to survive Vietnam, surely he can get a plane load of dependents, mostly wives and small children, traveling space available, delivered safely to Okinawa. Tammy looks the way my two sisters and three brothers, certainly my parents, expect me to look. A year ago, they left me behind at the University of New Mexico when my father was transferred to Kadena Air Base on Okinawa. They'd said goodbye to a sister, a daughter, who set her brick-washed hair into a flip on pink foam rollers, who wore madras plaid villager blouses with coordinating pleated kilts held closed with an oversized gold pin above the knee, who had a pair of tortoiseshell cat's eye glasses correcting her vision, a white cotton circular stitch brassiere shielding her breasts, Weijin loafers covering her clean feet, and heaven-sent cologne perfuming her thoroughly deodorized and depilated self. When I stepped off the plane, they would behold a vagrant in Levi's with peace sign patches on the ass and hems frayed to a dirty fringe from being trod upon by a pair of water buffalo hide sandals held on by one ring around the big toe, who parted her straight hair in the middle and left it to hang lank as old drapes on either side of a groovy new pair of John Lennon wire rims, who'd substituted patchouli oil for heaven scent and had discarded deodorant depilation and undergarments altogether. <laughs> for the past year, I had breathed civilian oxygen for the first time in my life. It caused me to forget that I was the daughter of Major Mason Patrick Root, just as much representative of the United States as the serviceman himself. It caused me to join an anti-war group on campus, Damsels in Descent. I started to remember who I was at Travis Air Force Base, where I had to hang around reading the Confessions of Nat Turner while my request for a Space A flight worked its way through MAPS. Just the acronyms for Space Available and Military Air Transport System were enough to resuscitate me with the air I had inhaled for the past 18 years. I was returning to a world where officer fathers lost their jobs when sons didn't mow the lawn, when daughters dated GIs, or mothers misbehaved too often at happy hour. Who knew what happened when offspring allied themselves with groups that advised draftees to swallow balls of tin foil and put laundry detergent in their armpits to fool induction center doctors. So that's what I was doing during the war. Well, I'm going to change hats from moderator to a participant, and I'll talk a little bit about my own experiences. I was drafted in January of 1969, as I remember it, the day that my wife Linda finished typing my master's thesis, but um, her memory isn't quite the same. But um, it was uh, an event that uh, focused my attention uh, significantly, and when I received that draft notice, I learned that if I could um, join the Army and volunteer to go to infantry officer candidate school, I could delay my entry into the Army for four months. And officer candidate school in the Army was unlike uh, officer candidate school in the other branches of service. And the other branches of service, um, officer candidate school lasts uh, oh, three to four months. Um, but in the Army, you would go to four months training, two months of basic training, and then two months of what was called advanced individual training, AIT, and then the, the uh, Army's Officer Candidate School program was six months. So the full training period uh, to become an officer in the Army was a 10-month period. So I figured it's January 1969. Nixon has just been inaugurated. I had no faith in Nixon uh, doing anything, but I felt like the country had to do something within the next year or it would explode. So I thought, if I join and get a four-month delayed entry and then have another 10 months of training, surely Vietnam will be over by the time I get through with all of that. Uh, uh, I faced that experience uh, the day I finished my master's degree uh, as someone who had participated fully in anti-war activities. Uh, I got clean for Jean and walked the, the, uh, the streets for Jean McCarthy in 1968. 
I participated in on-campus anti-war activities. So why would I volunteer to go to infantry officer candidate school if I was an anti-war figure? Well, I was, the, I was the son of conservative Texas family, and it would have ruined my family's uh, impression of themselves. It would have, uh, it would have harmed, I thought, um, it would have, have broken that family tie if I um, went to Canada um, or taken any of the other uh, avenues that people took to try to keep from going in the war. I mean, certainly I tried, like uh, many in my generation, to get into the reserves or the Air National Guard or uh, any of those things that would keep people out, but uh, I was from a poor family in a small town and had no connections. Uh, so uh, I went. Um, after the, the, uh, my years, my two years, uh, almost three years in the Army, and I had a, I was a, a lucky one. I went to infantry officer candidate school, and we began with 256 men and graduated 100, and uh, I was deemed an honor graduate. And that meant that as an honor graduate of officer candidate school, I could choose my assignment. CO called me in, said, you're an honor graduate, um, what do you want to do? I said, I want to branch transfer, sir, to the adjutant general's corps, the personnel, the wussy branch of the Army. Um, he made me stand uh, at attention for uh, six, uh, at least six hours, coming in every hour, asking me if I was sure I wanted to get out of the infantry. <laughs> and finally, he had no more time, and he had to allow me to branch transfer. Um, and it was a great, it was a great failure for a 51st OC company to have somebody like me get away. Uh, because they thought they'd gotten rid of everybody uh, out of those hundred, other 156 men. They thought everybody was gung-ho to go to Vietnam, and uh, I wasn't. Uh, but uh, I went to um, Fort Ben Harrison, Indiana, and uh, I was called in after two months of, uh, of adjutant general officer uh, training. I should have, I was supposed to go to Vietnam as a personnel uh, officer, one of those who stayed in the background and, uh, and watched people type but uh, they discovered I had a master's degree and they said, you know, are you interested in staying here in Indiana instead of going to Colorado and then to Vietnam? And I said, well, I, I like Colorado. And they said, but you won't go to Vietnam if you stay here and teach. And I said, I think I'll stay here and teach. I've always wanted um, to teach. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've always wanted to teach. But uh, after I got out of the Army and people would say, oh, you got drafted in 1969. So, what was your Vietnam experience? And I would say, well, I didn't go to Vietnam. And it was like my experience was insignificant. Oh, you didn't go to Vietnam, and it was walk away. And, you know, Vietnam was central to my life, um, to my generation's life. Everybody who lived through that time was affected by Vietnam. And so after I wrote this, this book about training, about what it was like to be trained to be an infantry officer in Vietnam, I dedicated this book to Vietnam veterans everywhere, to those who went and those who didn't. And you know, Sarah is a veteran of the Vietnam era. Um, the unborn are, in some, to some extent, veterans of the Vietnam era in the sense that Vietnam altered the way we think about our government the way all of us, it's certainly my generation. I mean, I was a young, patriotic Texan. I believed in all of the ideals of my country uh, until Vietnam. Um, you know, I still would like to be an old patriotic Texan, but um, because of Vietnam, I am cautious, and I am not one who uh, will accept my country right or wrong the way that I might have at one time. And I think that uh, that that's, you know, Vietnam altered the way we uh, the way we thought about things. Um, and so, after being deferential to the fact that I did not go to Vietnam, I realized that my experience with Vietnam was a significant shaping part of my life. And that uh, rather than sort of being, uh, oh well, I'm sorry, what happened to me, and uh, that I didn't have the same experience as others in my generation. I realized that my experience, while completely different from those who went, was also shaped irrevocably 
irrevocably by Vietnam. Vietnam has been and will always be part of, uh, of my experience. So it's a different point of view. That's one of the reasons I think this panel is, is uh, suggests points of view because we all have different points of view. We, we represent almost all of the, the different uh, branches. Uh, I see that some, uh, some uh, members of the Navy are out here in the audience, so at least the Navy's represented. And the Marines have a kind of uh, awkward relationship with the, with the Navy, but we've got the Army, we the go. Air Force, uh, the Navy, and, uh, or at least the Marines and, and uh, Navy in the, uh, in the audience. So I thought to, I would read just one page, which is the prologue to, to my novel, which I think sort of uh, I hope is, is somewhat representative, and then we'll take questions from the audience. This is the prologue titled At the End of Our Time. All of this happened a long time ago, long enough that it should have been as dim as a fading tail light on the horizon. But it takes so little for it to spring on me unbidden. One day, walking through the zoo, I came upon an old black bear at the back of its cage, looking over its shoulder at me, and standing in a position that suddenly jolted me. I stood looking at at it with tears rolling down my cheeks, the other zoogors walking softly past me like I was a sidewalk loony. Or maybe I'll catch snatches from an old song like Bridge Over Troubled Water, Let It Be, or Rainy Night in Georgia, and I'm arrested and cast back into the world of memory. The sound of a helicopter or the sight of a fading peace symbol will do it, a bed of pine needles, the heft of an old knife, even a woman in a dark blue evening dress if she's got dark hair and white shoulders. I'll go for a while without sliding back into the past, and I'll think it's disappeared finally, slipped into the crevices of memory. And then I'll see someone riding a horse, or maybe hear the sound of a train, and there it'll be. The faces and names, Budwell, Trailer, Ransick, Schrode, Garrett, Thompson, Hayes, O'Hara, spring to the mind's eye and I see them as in an old newsreel. I thought that this was just my story, something I'd carry around with me, but now I've decided that yes, it's my story, and I guess that it might be others too, those who were there and who lived through it, those who traveled in the wake of it, and maybe even a story for those who came after. So, with that, We'll, we'll open it now for questions from the audience uh, if, and, and comments. Uh, this is a, if you have something to say, then certainly this is the time to say it, or if you have questions uh, for the panel. Uh, any, uh, anybody have any uh, comments or questions? I have, I have a quick comment. Okay. I received my draft notice in Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> I went to my company gunny and said, I've been drafted, i got to go home. <laughs> Yes. Sir, I wondered, um, since I've shared some of your experiences in the military um, family uh, life, I wondered if you would want to talk a little bit about how your um, your experiences with damsels in descent affected your relationship with your father. Um, and would you repeat the question? She, uh, Michelle was wondering how uh, my my war, my anti-war experiences affected my relationship with uh, with my family. And um, I, you know, I, the only family I knew was the one I grew up in, and it, it might have been fairly atypical, but it, you know, listening to Bob and listening to Mark, a couple things resonate with me. Uh, one was the idealism that Mark's talking about, and I don't think there are more idealistic group of people on earth than true idealistic military people, and my father was certainly in that group. One of the things I wanted to capture in, in the book was his huge sense of disillusionment around the Vietnam era. And it was shared by all his friends, the people that he would speak with. So that was, he was disillusioned on, I would say, two levels. Number one, strategically. He thought, there's no way, and I have a long section, not that long, but a fairly short section in my book which is pretty much taken verbatim from things that he said to me. And I'm, I'm going to read just like a, a paragraph or two because it, it pretty much sums up every, you know, what I knew about Vietnam at the time and where it came from. Um, and in this, in this short little paragraph, 
the dad is, is talking to, to his daughter about her anti-war activities, and, and first of all, he said, you know, you, this is the service that has clothed you and fed you and, and, and supported us your entire life, and it's incredibly disloyal. You understand that? And then she said, yes, sir. And then he said, toward that end, I'm going to supply a few legitimate gripes to help you fill in the blanks a little. Containment. That was Curtis LeMay's big theory after World War II. And Curtis LeMay was the guy who started Strategic Air Command, essentially was my dad's boss, and essentially was the one, he, he was always pushing for uh, what he would call a, an inoculatory war. He wanted to like inoculate the Soviet Union with a nice little nuclear bomb. And uh, the character Dr. Strangelove was based after him. <laughs> no country in the history of the world has ever exercised such restraint, contained, not conquered. That was the mission after the war. That was the mission of the 38, 38th first in Yakota. That, that wasn't my dad's squadron, but that was the one I gave this character. Do you think Germany would have been content with that if they'd come out on top of Japan? No, we got a pretty good glimpse in, in Nanking, Singapore, the Philippines, of just exactly how Japan celebrates victory. We were, at, we were at Bernadette, the glittering edge of America's sword. Look where it got us. I'm astonished by everything my father is saying, by the tone of regret he is saying it in, but mostly by the simple fact that he is addressing these thoughts to me. Would you like some ideas about what you, what you damsels might want to dissent? Try this. The Vietnam War is the only war in the history of man where enemy territory is sanctuary, where we systematically bomb our allies into oblivion while the enemy's country is off limits. What genius thought up those rules of engagement? My father doesn't care that I don't answer. He seems to have forgotten that I'm sitting next to him. No one's ever fought a war like this before, where you hand the enemy your ass on a platter, then have to snatch it away and hit him over the head with it. The numb nuts in Washington think we're going to take Charlie apart with pre-announced saturation raids. Never happened, number one daughter. What none of them wants to hear is that the North Vietnam Vietnamese have created the most impenetrable ground defense in history around Hanoi, Haiphong. Berlin, Vienna, Tokyo, piece of cake compared to what Charlie's got. It's a parody of warfare, an expensive half-assed intervention in the wrong cause, in the wrong country, in the wrong part of the world. You know, that really echoed with me. There's some things my father was saying to me in 19, you know, the late 60s, wrong war, wrong country, wrong time, and you know, it may resonate with somebody else, a few other people here. So, um, my family didn't have problems with my, my dissent, at one point I went to him and, and said, because the military is so tightly knit, everybody knows everything in a freakish sort of way. I mean, I don't have to tell you, I, I came on base and everybody I ran into knew how old I was, all about my anti-war activities, uh, they had pictures that had been taken in uh, Albuquerque of me marching, and so I, and this is, you know, this is not good. For an, air, for an officer. This is just really not good to have his daughter out there doing this. And I talked to him, I said, uh, if you want me to stop, I'll stop, tell me. And he said, you know, I didn't risk my ass, you know, to have the Huns in World War II shooting up my ass so somebody else's daughter could have freedom of speech. And that was, that was the end of the discussion. But um, I don't know how atypical that is, but that was, you know, that was the kind of wonderful father I had. Yes. Therefore, uh, Trump is um, using democracy into the nation. Uh, it is forcing the majority to participate in some decision for the minority. The, the question is about the effect of the draft on getting us. That, that it's less democratic not having a draft? So is that? To, to, to institute the draft is a would would uh, lose democracy. Yeah, because you you force it, especially in the case of uh, Michael. Uh, to they are kids, they really don't know what decision they need to do it, and sometimes they are forced because it's it. Uh, but uh, and, uh, I I say they force the majority to go and participate in something to is decided. So the, the question is about so the the overall effect on the uh, the draft on democracy. Uh, yeah. you know, I mean, um, I was I was drafted before there was a lottery, and uh, you know it seems to me that there are there 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 are, there, there are very good arguments on both sides of the question. You know, the the argument for a 
universal service, I think, is very strong in the sense that one of the things that happened when there was a draft, that it was a democratic element, a democratizing element in some ways, in the sense that, that there were many people from all walks of life who got drafted, except for those maybe who really had, uh, you know, at least during Vietnam, who had some way out. But to, without the war during the draft, there, it was a, it was a, dem a, a democratic force. And um, um, so an argument for some sort of universal service, I think, is an argument on the side of a, of a democratizing force. On the other hand, that uh, what happened during Vietnam was that you know, there was a disproportionate number of minorities who were drafted, a disproportionate number of minorities who ended up uh, going and dying in Vietnam, and that certainly is not a, dem a democratic force. So comments from anybody else on the panel? <coughs> I've got some things. I, I support a draft simply because with no exemptions. If it's not worth your, if the war is not worth your son or daughter's life, it's not worth somebody else's. Yeah. And if you can't support a war, like, there are 5,000 military over the age of 50 serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, there are a lot of you in this room that are 50 and younger. If it's not worth your life and you're not encouraging your son or daughter to enlist, I don't see how you can support it. They work. I'll make back, back here. Yes. Rebecca. I'll let Bob Flynn address that because that's really sort of the main theme of his book, The Last Click, and that's the effect of, uh, of the way that um, the media shapes the way we understand any, any war. And um, so I'll ask Bob to address that. In Vietnam, with press credentials, you could go almost any place you wanted to go, and the military would get you there and if things got bad, they would risk their lives to get you out. You, you could always leave. A soldier could never leave. You could always say, I want out of here. Uh, you could not go to the morgue and deny. But as far as I know, and there may have been some other places, there were times they said you shouldn't go there. And uh, Michael Croft, uh, Steve Croft, who's on 60 Minutes now, and I wanted to go with a small team of Marines. It was a, it was a, what they call a black hammer operation. There were two helicopters, one with a searchlight and one with a machine gun and rockets, with machine, two machine guns and rockets. And without light, they would fly around trying to attract fire. And well, they sent out the Marines, a small group of Marines, to draw Viet Cong after them. And then they would come out with the searchlights, and so it was a way of taking over the night. In this area, the Viet Cong rarely moved at night because this was a very successful operation. And they're doing something a lot very similar to it in Iraq today. Because it was so small, the uh, leader, who was a corporal, I think he was uh, maybe 20 years old, but he was in charge of a village and uh, a squad of Marines. And about about twi of about a platoon-sized uh, force of Vietnamese popular forces, 20 years old. He asked us not to go. And, and Steve Croft, who knew him better than I did, said if he, and I almost got his name right there, if, anyway, if he doesn't want us to go, I'm not going to go. So we didn't go, and uh, they, anyway, they did go out, and they were chased, and uh, there was a significant battle, and uh, everybody came home safely uh, on our side. And, and, of course, the contrast today is that uh, you know, 
reporters are embedded, which is, I find an interesting term, but embedded, and so they have a fairly limited view, whereas Bob says that uh, in Vietnam, the reporters could travel fairly freely if they had the courage to, to go to some of the things that then they could report on them. But uh, today, the, the information, it seems to be much more much more limited in the way that we, certainly uh, what we know about Fallujah is very, is very limited uh, until after the fact. Let me add one other fact. I think that media has been absolutely craven since Vietnam. Grenada, uh, the Persia, the first, the first war in the Gulf, they have not done their duty. Uh, and I think they've been absolutely craven about it. We are now ranked 32nd in the world in freedom of the press. I thought we were number one. Well, I, um, it, it was, it, stunning to me the number of people who saw the movie 9-11 and what they would mention again and again is the footage that they had not seen the footage that we don't see on on our television screens is very essential uh, footage about civilian casualties uh, there's a huge percentage of our population that believes it's not happening because they're not seeing it on their television sets other questions yes over here The question is, have I returned to Vietnam since? No. And <clears throat> probably not. Uh, my feeling is that I lost nothing there but my innocence, and I don't see the point in trying to go back and, and find it. Uh, that's the flip answer. Uh, the reality is that I don't think, and I've been in therapy for like 20 years with this thing reality is I'm not sure that I would ever be emotionally or psychologically prepared to confront that reality again and I, and I know I know a lot of a lot of uh, uh, Vietnam veterans who have gone back uh, and who've had positive experiences I know some that went and had had memories reawoken and, and and then that became their reality and so they had that those issues to deal with so I'm saying now I won't go Bob, Bob. Uh, I went back in 1989 when it was against the law for travel agencies to arrange travel it was very difficult to get there I went to Laos Cambodia and Vietnam Cambodia was better off in 1989 than Vietnam was Financially, economically, the people had uh, a little more freedom. Uh, they had a little more freedom to do things. The Vietnam, the army of Vietnam occupied Cambodia at that time. The, the part that the Khmer Rouge didn't occupy, the army of Vietnam occupied. Uh, South Vietnam was worse off in uh, 1989 than it was in 1970 and 71 when I was there. The bank of, uh, in Hanoi, the only bank in the country, almost collapsed. Their economic system almost collapsed in 1988, and they opened up to embedded capitalism. Everybody in front of their house sold a package of cigarettes, uh, a can of beer, or a can of Coca-Cola, which was there. Uh, before anybody else was, I think Coca-Cola was there. And when they sold that, they would buy two more and sell those. And that was the kind of, that was the way they supported themselves. There was a rice ration, so they said nobody starved. But if you saw anybody that had any kind of flesh on them, it was a communist official. I tried, I uh, had, I had uh, what I call VC dreams, uh, Vietcong dreams, uh, nightmares, until um, I went back. Uh, it was very, very tough emotionally. I would, I went to Hanoi and got press credentials and went back to an area I was in and it got to almost every place. I had a, uh, an interpreter from the foreign ministry with me and a driver. I got almost every place I wanted to go. There were some places that she had to go and talk to them. Sometimes it would take hours to get into a place. 
and a few places, military bases, the old military bases you could not go to. They said it was because they were dangerous, because of uh, uh, mines, and it may have been, I suspect they were. Anyway, you couldn't go there. Uh, 1989, there were problems out. The Marines had a booby trap school in, in China Beach that they sent me through, and uh, I tripped. I mean, I think I tripped every mine or booby trap that was available, and that was, uh, it was 1989. It was hard when I was off the beaten track, and uh, there were some old French fortifications. There were places around Kuchi that I went to, and I was careful where I put my feet. I walked in somebody else's footsteps. I was so terrified that there still might be mines around. I went back in 1994 with my wife. Things had trem improved tremendously. Uh, the economy was, had improved, but people were in better shape. They were happier. They were freer. In 1989, South Vietnam was in much better shape than North Vietnam because there were so many Vietnamese in America who were sending money back to their folks. In fact, I had to witness because they needed, Vietnamese couldn't come into our hotel unless they were going to the restaurant for a cup of coffee or something. And so this guy had $1,000 he had brought, he was trying to transfer to a family. $1,000, you know, you were a millionaire in Vietnam. American dollars, you were a millionaire in Vietnam in 1989. 1994, I went back and took my wife with me and I, <laughs> I think for the first time, she understood what some of it was like. And I'd like to point out that uh, one of the, uh, the writers featured in the exhibit, uh, Bill Broyles, um, was in Vietnam and then went back and wrote a book uh, about his return to Vietnam. Uh, Brothers in Arms, is that Brothers it? Brothers in Arms. And uh, very, very, uh, if you're interested in what that kind of experience might be like, then uh, Bill Broyles. Uh, Bill Broyles is the is it wrote the screenplay for the Polar Train, is that the name of that new, uh, and so Polar, Polar Express, Train. Polar Express, so that's why he's not with us, uh, he, that he was, uh, he's been working on that, which really got dogged in the New York Times, but, uh, but he'll come back, he also did Apollo 13, uh, and the TV series uh, China Beach, which is one of the things that's really featured uh, in the exhibit, uh, as well as Brothers in Arms. Other questions, comments from the audience? Yes, sir. Uh, from my perspective, maybe for everyone, did this one have war? No, sir. And, uh, Short answer, no, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Did the media lose? No. No. The media didn't lose it. The, the, and from my limited perspective now, understand, down at squad level, I knew we weren't going to win. The very day I left Vietnam in 1967, because I saw my replacement get off that airplane and walk by me. When I turned and looked at him, and he turned around, and we were all filing, you know, two lines of, of Marines. We were looking at them all nice and pink and clean, and, you know, press new green utilities, the FNGs. <laughs> And we're walking on the airplane, and I'm looking at this guy, and I realized he was my replacement. And I wondered who was going to replace him, and who was going to replace him. As Bob Flynn said, that war was that war was never winnable, and it's especially tough when we look at it one way. You know, oh, we're actually two ways. And one, we're we're trying to prop up a a, a government that's already shaking. But when you're fighting people who, who are fighting for their own country, who view the war as national, nationalistic, it's even tougher. We fought for, you fight a war with what you have. We had the bullets and the bombs and the airplanes and the tanks. They had people. And so what they used was people. Uh, they built magnificent tunnels under the uh, 25th Infantry. 25th Infantry. At Kuchi, they pop out of these tunnels and bang away and send the entire division into a panic and duck back down and disappear. Uh, ingenious. Those people. I fought them and I respected the hell out of them, especially the North Vietnamese. Bob, Sarah? I know Bob and Sarah both have sort of the, at least in their books, they both talk about the, the failure of strategy and the fact that uh, the sanctuaries in Laos and Cambodia which were off limits to uh, to Americans, maybe uh, put the 
the United States at a huge disadvantage. Um, and if Marble Mountain was off limits, they had snipers. They knew the Vietcong were up there. They had snipers and they overlooked a Marine air base, a helicopter base. But it was a sacred mountain. You couldn't go up there. Uh, there were a lot of sanctuaries like that. And, and uh, you know, I, I can see why. I, I, just, I have heard that we have destroyed a lot of uh, mosques in Fallujah. I hope that's not true. Because that's, you know, that you, they don't, you don't forget things like that. The people who live there. And when everybody, all the Americans in Vietnam wanted to go home. The Vietnamese didn't want to go home. They were home. <laughs> also, I want to point out that we all talk about it like, and the Vietnamese call it the American War. But there were more foreign troops other than U.S. who fought in Vietnam under the CETO Agreement Treaty than fought in Korea under the U.N. flag. The Australian New Zealand had, and New Zealand had more had more troops in Vietnam than the coalition has in Iraq, and South Korea had twice as many troops. Can I, I Every side of the CETO agreement had forces there except Thailand, and they supplied air bases and, and Thailand and security for them. Um, I kind of skipped by your your question about the media. It was actually the media that began to expose a lot of what was going on. Uh, unlike now, I think Dr. Busby used embedded. They weren't, you know, bombs. So they went, came and went as they pleased, and they saw a lot more than any reporter has since who's gone into the military. Sorry, sir. No, 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 no. Yes, yes, sir. I, I was talking to respond to Robert Kennedy's question about Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> I, wish, uh, I wish I had a, a more background in history because I think historians are going to see the wars of the 20th century that really started in the late 19th century as the end of colonialism and they're all, there's really just one war that includes, uh, well, it includes uh, the Boer War, it includes the uh, the war between Russia and Japan in about 1904, First World War, Second World War, the Cold War. I think you're going to see those as just battles in one big war over realigning the country. Now colonialism is dead, the old colonialism, but I think the 21st century may be the battle of the new colonialism. That's what uh, George Orwell wrote about in 1984 when he published that in 1948. Yes. This is exactly my next question. This is a, the question is, was the Cold War a tool of imperialism or a force that uh, 
continuation. Anybody have a have a comment on that? Bob, you sort of introduced that. You haven't. I, <laughs> I don't want to hog the mic here, but, <laughs> but uh, I see the Vietnam War as almost uh, inevitable after the containment policy. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, we discovered that there was not really an arms race. That the, the Soviet Union's military budget stayed flat. We had an arms race, and they didn't. <laughs> that Khrushchev was terribly afraid of us and so he was try he had his own containment policy and just as we were trying to trying to uh, exert our will over all these other countries as a buffer against them they were trying to do the same against us the Cold War may have been actually uh, it would be uh, probably a hundred years before we know but the Cold War may have been the, the mistake not the Vietnam War but the Cold War and all the other corollary wars. We put, as far as the Cold War, we put the Shah of Iran in control of Iran. We were uh, allies of Saddam Hussein and we helped him to power. We were allies with Osama bin Laden. I really thought at one time every war has ended with the start of the next war. And I thought maybe the Cold War is because it wasn't really a major war, just small wars that maybe we would get out of this one without starting the next one. Well, the next one's already started, and it's a direct outgrowth of the Cold War. Well, there we have a, there was a hand. Right time for about one more, one more question. The young lady, the young lady in the back. Yeah, oh, okay. We'll take two more. Back and far back down the black. Yes. Could you speak up a little bit louder? We couldn't hear you. Okay, reception on homecoming for uh, Michael. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> we look at reception now. I say we, uh, me and other veterans of, of the war in Vietnam. We look at the reception since the Gulf. And on one level, we wish we'd had that. And on the other level, when I came back in, uh, in 1967, this is going to be a kind of a Kirby answer. When I came back in 1967, I was told that the war for me was over now. That I could forget about it and go on with my life. Well, it took me a few more years after that to realize I enlisted in the Marine Corps at 17. You know, I had no life. Whatever values, whatever moral race, whatever morals I'd learned, I'd learned in the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps had taught them to me. And one of those was we, the Marine Corps fights the wars. And that's what we do, and, you know, off you go. Which is fine until Gulf War I. Because what I came home to was essentially indifference. There was, there was, I, did, I did encounter some hostility, but not much. But the indifference was worse. Bob, you came back after going uh, by your own volition. What was your reception when you came back? Well, I returned to the classroom, the campus situation. Nobody wanted to hear about it. Nobody. Yeah, nobody wanted to hear about it. Uh, I could say I just got back from Vietnam. Okay, well, what's for lunch? Really, they just <laughs> avoided it. Nobody wanted to have a conversation about it. That's the reason veterans only talked about the war to veterans. You know, trying to describe war to somebody who's not been in a war, to a war, is like trying to explain sex to a unit. There's just, there's no, there's no way to approach it. There's no entry level. And we have one final cool question over here. <laughs> yes. Yes, they are. And in a way, so the way you kind of answered that, but I want to know what, I'm very sad about the current war. In fact, I'm very angry about it. That's my, but I want to know what, what you think we've learned. You know, everybody always says we learned from Vietnam. What do you think our government has learned from Vietnam? That's probably a good last question, and why don't we each one answer it, so then we'll start with Bob. 
They learn to control the media. Bingo. <laughs> Sarah? Um, gosh. Uh, it, it, it was so interesting to me, um, the Swift Boat controversy, and to see how huge the unhealed wound is and how immediate, how incredibly present um, that experience still is for Americans, whether you lived through it or didn't live through it. I was, I was stunned at, at how apparently nothing was learned and, and how Kerry was excoriated for his anti-war activities when I saw in my own family, watching my father and his friends, the officer corps, go over there and see how messed up the war was, and they came back against the war, and you just, it was a thing, it, that was what, you went over and you saw how it was unwinnable, it was never going to happen, and if you had intelligence and conscience, you did what Kerry did, why that was such a huge problem, I don't understand. But I, I think it just speaks to how emotional the Vietnam War still is. It, and, you know, it's tragic what Bob has said and what Michael said that, that we haven't talked about it. Because the things we don't talk about are the things that control us, and we're still controlled by the Vietnam War. And now this current war, um, it's, in, in, in my anti-war activities during the Vietnam War, the, it was generational. It was a huge generational split, and we were, uh, we were united against the war, but it was a sense of pointing out to dad that he was doing something wrong. You know, everyone in my generation thought, you know, this is a big mistake, but we had faith in the whole system. We were, we were, you could say we were against the establishment, but we felt like there was an establishment. And in the current situation, there's a huge feeling like, um, dad, or maybe it isn't dad, because you know the paternity tests are still questionable. So whoever is driving the station wagon, we're all trapped in the station wagon and heading off the side of a cliff. And, and there's not that feeling like somebody really knows what's going on. Michael? Years ago, I put this little political cartoon together. It's got kind of funny. It was a black and white drawing of a, of a grunt, a hard hat on the helmet and ammunition belt straight across his chest. Totally not real. But there were four lines. A lot of, and a lot of combat veterans today see the shrinks and the therapy groups at the vet centers and, and the VA hospitals. So I had a little four line statement. The vet center counselor says, so you were in Vietnam? And the anonymous grunt says, yeah. The counselor says, yeah, when were you there? And the anonymous grunt says, last night. Mm. Well, and for way too many of us, Vietnam was just last night. Well, I'll, I will end this discussion with two of my favorite quotes that uh, reflect on this question. The, the first one is the old quote uh, that um, those who do not learn from history are forced to relive it. And the second one is the one thing that we learn from history is we do not learn from history. Um, well, I'd like to thank all of the panelists, thank all of you for coming, and uh, there are books uh, available for purchase, and uh, everyone here would be uh, delighted to sign books. Those of you who want to, uh, to, to get uh, a book signed, uh, it's not that far from, uh, from Christmas, and, <laughs> and uh, dad or grandma or uh, someone might like uh, one of these books. Uh, but again, thank you for coming, and thank the panelists.